Hi, this is Jeffrey Tucker. This is my video podcast on Hans Hermann Hoppe's theory about the decline of the state. And I'm going to be talking about four distinct signs that you can, you can look for to see uh, what constitutes a state in decline. I think all four of these things are very much in, in our midst. I think we can recognize them. I mean, it seems a little crazy to say. I mean, we're living in the age of drones and ever more impositions on liberty, the, a time of, of astonishing levels of taxation, regulation. The state seems to be on the march on one hand. On the other hand, I think if you use this kind of analysis, you can see that the reverse is true, the opposite is true, that in fact, uh, the state is on the decline, it's collapsing, it's losing its, uh, the key monopolistic features that lead it to have any kind of security um, over, over our lives and our property and uh, in, in its control of the social order. That if you just back away from the situation a little bit, you, you begin to see a world in which the state is crumbling, really. Uh, for, because of its sheer implausibility and inability to keep up with private markets. So that's, that's what this little uh, podcast is about. And um, it's, I'm doing this as a substitute for the whiskey bar, which is something that I provide through the Leslie Fair Club, an opportunity for people to talk and, and engage these, these, these subjects. Uh, there's no chat window, obviously, on this, so you'll just have to bear with me. And let me see if I can lay it out. So this book is called Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. And he always starts his thinking with what he calls a state of nature. Now, sometimes people think of a state of nature as like some sort of strange, chiliastic vision of a world, you know, that's very much like our own, uh, unlike our own, uh, that uh, none of the things we recognize about ourselves or the world around us exists as some imaginary state of uh, human perfectibility and perfect peace or something like that. That's not what Hoppe means by the state of nature. What he really means is a world without economics, without economic development, without capital, without access to the material goods that we have made, you and I have made, and everybody else in the world has made, and everybody who's came before us has made. So let's just wipe out the whole of human history and just imagine uh, a world in which a, a handful of people are plunked down into nature, uh, a world without technology or any economic development. The big problems you face are survival. Uh, you don't have a place to live, so you have to find a cave. You don't have anything to eat, and eating is a particular problem, uh, actually, for, for the human population, because you have to do it every day. It's not like you can, you can just eat once and go, well, it's a new year, um, I'll just you know, kill a bull and shove it into my mouth and live for the next year on that. It doesn't work like that. You've got to find new food every day because food spoils. There's no refrigerators. Um, you've got to you've got to find the ostrich eggs or whatever. You can't outrun the animals. So fast moving animals are ruled out to you. And uh, you've got to you've got to pick pick what grows. So you you and you've got to find water, and so on and so on. So it's a very, a very difficult life. I mean, this is, this is the most miserable possible thing. A state of nature is a state of, of, uh, of dire misery with short lives and uh, vast amounts of suffering and toil. That's basically the state of nature. So he asked the question, in this world, why would you create a state? And that's a very interesting one, because most people just assume that the state enhances human well-being. That if it weren't for the state, that we would all be kind of you know, in a state of um, you know, massive uh, suffering. We wouldn't have roads, we wouldn't have justice, we wouldn't have security, we wouldn't have prosperity, uh, we would have booms and busts, <laughs> or, or whatever. Um, so we need the state for all these things. But, you know, he points out that uh, you would never create a state, actually, under these conditions. Like, you wouldn't sit around with, with your tribe and say, you know, what we really need to do is appoint two guys we really, really respect and give them all control over law and tell them to enforce the law, to uh, not be despotic, and to install mechanisms by which that they themselves control to ensure that they will not be despotic and give these small group of people the right to take whatever they want from us anytime they want and live on it 
and if we decide to overthrow them or revolt against them, um, then we're guilty of you know treason. So what what would creating such an institution actually accomplish for this? group of people living in a state of nature? And I think, yeah, the answer is rather obvious, absolutely nothing. Uh, monopolizing the right to aggressive violence within a handful of people uh, serves no great, no social uh, function whatsoever. I mean, it, and, and it's actually certain to cause the society to be worse off than they were before. And What's true of that small little tribe in a state of nature is true for the modern world also. The state actually contributes nothing whatsoever to our social well-being. There's nothing the state can't, uh, is capable of doing that's unique to the state that actually improves society beyond a point at which it would otherwise uh, be thriving. Uh, which is not to say that all societies without states are perfect uh, in every way. No, they're not. Uh, life is hard. Um, there's myriad problems that always exist. Uh, anarchists don't believe that somehow getting rid of the state will cause uh, a, a blossoming of, of human perfection or anything like that. All we're saying is that it will get rid of one of the main problems, if not the main problem in the world today, which is that the handful of people have a monopoly control over, the, uh, over a system of aggression and violence, and they control that very system. And that contributes nothing, and it takes away from us. So that's the core argument. So the question is, it's a very interesting one, actually. Hans sort of turns it around. Sometimes people ask, why are there revolutions? Why do states fail? Why do states decline? Hans asks a different question. Why aren't there always revolutions? Because the state is always failing, why do we put up with it at all? Uh, and that's a very interesting uh, issue. I mean, that's, that is the, the critical question. And the answer he gives is essentially the same one that David Hume g gave, and uh, Etienne de la Boetie and um, Murray Rothbard and, and Ludwig van Mises and other very fundamental thinkers in the history of, of, of politics which is that the state is sustained only by public opinion. Now, you might say, no, no, the reason the, state's, the state thrives is that it has all the guns. Well, that's true enough. But even violence alone doesn't actually cause the state to control society. You only need to look at U.S. foreign policy and see, you know, how well has the U.S. done in Iraq? You know, how well has the U.S. done in uh, Afghanistan or in any state that it's invaded and tried to control through pure force? I mean, even the military itself discovered this. Uh, you know, the counterinsurgency tactics of today are designed to uh, bring services to the civilian population to build schools and buy off loyalties and this sort of violence alone never works to bring about the kind of control that you want. I mean, after all, most jails uh, are not controllable through violence alone. There have to be other things. Human beings are a recalcitrant bunch. We're inherently rebels. We resist uh, being captured and controlled like robots. So what is the answer to why the state survives at all? And the answer is, uh, according to this tradition of thought, uh, that we are convinced that the state is doing good for us somehow, some way. There's propaganda involved, there's ideology. Uh, we're, we're, we're convinced somehow that the state is benefiting us. Uh, this is a wrong view, but, uh, but our consciousness is invaded, and we're uh, told that, th that this system of statism is better than what, what we'd otherwise face in this, this terrifying world without a state, you know, wh which we all just kill each other. Right? So that's, that's, that's basically it. So what Han says is that the state has to monopolize four critical institutions. Communication, education, money, and the security apparatus, or justice, and the police. Uh, that's what the state seeks to control. These are the four commanding heights, to use the, the, the term that you saw in uh, a movie that came out in uh, a PBS series in the 1980s. These are the commanding heights of society. If the state controls those four things, then it will control everything.
So, you know, one of the things that's really great about our times is you can look back at these YouTube videos that have been made, that were made, you know, in the, during the New Deal or the 1940s or the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, propaganda films about price control, about the glories of government. I like watching them because they seem so utterly ridiculous to us now, and it's hard to imagine that anybody took them seriously in the past, but this was the mechanism by which the state controlled uh, the world. Um, that was the method of communication. On education front, uh, earlier in the 20th century, the government achieved a near monopoly of uh, monopolistic control over education with a, with a handful of private schools being the outlying case on money. Early Again, early part of the 20th century, uh, the banking money interests finally consolidated their control in the Federal Reserve, which was given a charter by the federal government to uh, be the permanent funding institution for the state and liberating this, the government from having to collect taxes from us, which turns out to annoy people. So they want to spend a lot of money. Uh, you have to have some institution that prints money so they can always guarantee the debt that thereby results. And uh, the security apparatus, of course, I mean, who disputes that government should have police and run the courts? So. Uh, what I, what I did in this article that I wrote called Four Signs of a Weakened State was assess these four institutions in light of the digital age, by which I mean the world since 1995. So the most obvious case is communication. That monopoly has been utterly smashed. The state wanted to control it completely. You know, in the past, if we wanted to communicate with each other, and this wasn't that long ago, you have to remember. We had, the government brought a phone to us, and it owned the phone system, and we could make phone calls. We had to pay a lot of money if we wanted to go long distance, as they called it, long distance. Or we could communicate through the government mail system. And that was pretty much it. And we got newspapers, but that's not really communication, that's just reading, right? Um, and, but otherwise, the state controlled everything, TV, radio, the mails, if we wanted to talk and talk back, it took many, many days, and uh, the government had the total monopoly on that. The monopoly on communication has been utterly smashed, and many times over. Uh, it began with email, but it's continued with, with, with the whole internet and the World Wide Web, and uh, now uh, daily new apps are coming out, enabling communication to take place across borders, uh, more cheaply than ever before, even to the point of being just completely free. So this critical institution that the state wanted to monopolize, you know, it hasn't, it's no longer monopolized. The state has utterly failed in this respect. And I think this is the driving force for the world libertarian revolution, it seems to me. So that's one just completely gone. I mean, there's no chance of controlling communication. Intellectual property, of course, is a major way in which the state is trying to at least get some restraint on, on the communication uh, institutions that have been developed since 1995. That's why they're so, so dangerous. But in the big picture, the monopoly has been completely smashed. Education, through these same means, Education has been decentralized and universalized and globalized uh, to the point that, you know, you can learn anything online and you don't have to depend on government-assigned uh, certified teachers sitting in government-owned buildings in a government uh, kind of system. Education is, is, is everywhere. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's almost impossible to avoid it. It's a, extraordinary. You know, and the other thing is that institutions like homeschool represented a fundamental homeschooling, which, which came about, you know, probably and only because private schools were really too expensive for many, many people. Homeschooling represented a fundamental challenge to the government, in particular its compulsory schooling laws and its uh, preset legislated curricula. Uh, homeschooling just smashed that whole thing. Uh, as, uh, every state was terrified to crack down on it. Many try to regulate it, but most are unsuccessful. 
Um, this is a unique uh, freedom that Americans have that is very hard to obtain and 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 to uh, hold on to in places like uh, Western Europe. But homeschoolers have achieved so much in the U.S. Uh, you know, not just spelling bees, but in the arts and in music and in every area of life. Um, it's now a, a viable option. This has all happened within the last 20 years. It's quite extraordinary. So education, I wouldn't say it's entirely smashed. We still have public systems, which, by the way, are more and more being infused with private energy and private dollars. So American public schools can no longer be seen as entirely statist. Uh, many of them are, but many of them are mixed systems. Uh, more and more, the, even the financing is, is attached to private initiative and extracurricular activities are entirely funded by private money. So the, many public schools today are public in, in name only. Um, and this has been a trend for the last 30 years. So let's talk about money here now, uh, which is the third institution that Hans names. It was, the dollar was the undisputed king for a good part of uh, the 20th century. And the Fed was a kind of an agency of macroeconomic uh, central planning. Um, every economist had a theory about precisely what the Fed ought to do to cause certain economic outcomes. Well, just since 2008, we've seen that entire system just broken down. It's no longer the case that uh, these mechanisms are working. Uh, just yesterday, Janet Yellen, who's the vice chair of the Federal Reserve and probably the successor to Ben Bernanke, at least many people think so, was going on about the importance of having uh, extremely low interest rates to bring about low unemployment. Well, that hasn't happened, and it's not going to happen. Uh, the Federal Reserve policy, if anything, has just been brought about opposite results from what it hoped to achieve. And the banking system is in many ways broken. If you want to, if you're a business, you want to merge with another business and you want to seek conventional forms of financing, it's probably not going to be there for you. The, the loan uh, feature and function of the banking system is not anything like it was even five years ago. And the banking system has been converted into a kind of, it's almost a nationalization has taken place. So it's not like performing normal functions anymore. So the loan function of banking has been outsourced now to third third parties. It's, it's, it's taking place through uh, private lenders. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending is a very, very big deal. Uh, that, you, private financing for, for business and uh, business acquisitions is more and more uh, common and not done through the conventional banking system. And even in the area of money, we're starting to see uh, money take different forms. Uh, Bitcoin's an obvious case, but things like discount cards that you can you can you can uh, that serve as a kind of money. Amazon is coming up with a new system for Amazon coins uh, that allow you to earn revenue and then spend that revenue without ever having converted it to dollars. Uh, these are new forms of monetary instruments coming out, and they're coming about by the day. Uh, so you're starting to see the private sector invent new alternatives to the mainstream, uh, to, the, to the main money and banking system, which is an, an astonishing thing, actually. We need to fully appreciate what this means. Stuff like this didn't even exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Government had total control. Now, that's no longer the case. Now let's move on to the fourth area, security. This has been a dramatic change over the last 10 years. The Police in the United States didn't used to be militarized. They were widely thought to be part of the civilian order. I think it's never been true, but that was the propaganda. That was the lie. Uh, they're there to help us. You know, they're there to keep us safe from criminals. Uh, now, vast swaths of the population tend to regard the police as being more of a danger than the criminals themselves. Uh, nobody's happy to be pulled over by the cops. They seem like glorified tax collectors at best. Uh, their new powers allow them to seize your property just on suspicion of any kind of wrongdoing. Uh, they've become very much an extension of the greatest threat there is to humanity, which is the state itself, and no longer seen as part of the civilian order. Now, I'm not talking about any individual policeman uh, in particular. I mean, I, 
just had a, a nice coffee this morning with, with one at the convenience store that I, I saw this morning. It's a very nice fellow. So that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to something more fundamental about the institution itself. Um, it's, it's no longer seen as part of the civilian order. It never was. Um, now the police are widely considered to be a, a threat, and they've chosen sides. Uh, the justice system itself, nobody wants to get wrangled up with it. Uh, businesses use private arbitration services as a, a far, are far more than the government court system. They try to avoid government court trials at all cost. And private systems of justice are, are, and uh, contracts and arbitration are, have, have overwhelmingly swamped the official system. Of course, the rules by which we are, are living are still made by the, the state, but even that is coming under question. The whole, what Hans calls the security apparatus of the, the government is facing a fundamental challenge. It's the one that, the, of the four items, that's the one that's still most intact, but uh, it's being challenged uh, every day. And I'm talking about long-term trends here. So if, if, if all four of these institutions collapse uh, or, you know, become almost irrelevant to civilian society, which seems to be the trend, uh, what happens next? And this tradition of thought hasn't fully explored that uh, question. I don't think revolution immediately happens. I think most likely what happens is that you see a displacement uh, take place. Once the institutions of, of free society are built up and become robust, more functioning, and more uh, able to serve human needs, than the state system, that eventually people turn to the private systems and the public systems basically rot and die. It's kind of like what's happened to the post office, you know, over the last 10 years since the invention of email. Take that uh, analogy and expand it out more broadly, and you see a picture of a state that's kind of rotting from within. You know, it's like like a giant edifice that looks beautiful on the one hand, but there's little termites that are eating away all the columns and the foundation is cracked. Uh, when things turn exactly, I don't know, there are probably signs of it, but um, and how it happens and what it looks like, you know, every revolution takes a different form. Uh, even in 1989 and 1990, we saw uh, many different revolutions. Each one was unique. So it's being poss possible to speculate what uh, the future looks like in a, in a democratic society, but I, based on this model that Hoppe is laying out here, it seems to me that things are far more vulnerable than most people think. Well, in any case, that's the book. Uh, the book is The Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. It, it has a new introduction by, by Stefan Kinsella, uh, which I highly uh, recommend to you. You can get it at the Laissez-Faire Club, and uh, I would be thrilled for you to join the club and get uh, ebooks free, and also my author's uh, summaries so that you can dig through the books a little more quickly than you might otherwise. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, again, this is Jeffrey Tucker, the Laissez Faire Club.